I was going to say, you look awfully different today, Scott. Actually, Scott was glad. He really had kind of a busy morning. And she was glad I remained really good. Well, thank you, Lynn, for playing every Sunday. We appreciate it. Uh, and the 20th, we're going to have a stewardship breakfast at 8 o'clock. Uh, please let uh, Deb or April know if we can bring you something to make bacon, bread, cheese rolls, whatever. Is there any other announcements? If not, welcome to worship. I do have just a reminder that uh, we also have uh, meat and meat, M and M, as we call it, up at our place in Centerville, and that'll be the twenty-fourth which is a Thursday evening. If you are interested, there's a sign-up sheet in back. And um, kids in confirmation can come to that too if you want to come with your parents. So that would be a fun, a fun time. We usually have a good time. All of us are folks from uh, Faith United as well as Scandia. So please feel free to sign up for that if you would like to come. Let us begin our worship by standing for the invocation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's take a moment of silent reflection. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin, and we cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you and not our word to be, by all we have done, and by all we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us. God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us and for his sake, forgives us all our sins. As a fellow believer, I wish to remind you and declare to you your sins are entirely forgiven in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, and we have an opening hymn, All Creatures of Our God and King, which is number 527.
The love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
up to the Badlands and the Black Hills. Have any of you been there at all before? Yeah? Okay. Okay, you're going to get out there sometime, okay? Maybe we'll take a trip out there. It's fun. But what we saw there was totally amazing in terms of animals. Okay, so we saw big horn sheep. Those are sheep with the big curly horns. We saw two different kinds of deer, white tail and mule deer. We saw turkeys and other birds. We can see those are out here, right? But we also saw pronged horn antelopes. And here's the really cool thing. We saw hundreds of buffalo. Big, shaggy buffalo. Have any of you seen a buffalo before? Yeah. In fact, some of them are like taller than I am. They're, you know how they are? They've got that big hump on their back. And their hump is taller than I am. So we took pictures of these things. There were hundreds over here, and there's a couple over here, and we took pictures. And then, as we were going down the road, there was a big one right in the middle of the road. And we had to stop. Because he's right in the center. We couldn't go to the right or the left. And he's sitting there. And he's facing us, looking at us like this. And both of us are going, wow, beautiful animal, but I hope he doesn't come and charge and try to butt our car, right? So we're sitting there kind of going, okay, what do we do next? And he starts moving like this. He's walking this way, he's coming toward us. And it looked like maybe he was going to go on the left side like a car would, because we're on the right side of the road. And I'm in the passenger seat. But at the end, he decided to go to the right. And he wanted the grass that was in the ditch right by my tire. He started eating that, and I'm sitting there looking at this big, shaggy thing right outside my window. It was so awesome. Well, you know, God has created us to be in relationship with the created order. And animals are included in that. We're going to learn about that in our scripture this morning. How the animals are there for our benefit and for us to take care of them, as well as all of creation along with it. So, in light of that, we're going to pray a prayer for your pets and for all of creation. I got it right up here. So, let's bow and pray this together. Blessed are you, Lord God, who made every living thing in which the waters teem and every winged bird, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, the wild animals, you called it all good. Thank you for these animals, for its life that comes from you, and for the love and the joy that each of these brings. Please bless these creatures. Let our loving care for these creatures be a reflection of your loving nature. We praise you for all your beauty and creation, and especially in the expression of your love. We ask, O oh Lord, that you bless us and all of our pets here, as well as all the created order. Blessed are you, Lord our God, in all your creatures. Amen. All right. And I've got something for you for helping me out today, so let me grab that too. of any of these if you like. Yeah, that's a good one. Want anything in there? Oh, you've got the bag. Is there something in this bag? Yeah, those, I think those are bubbles. What's good in there? That might be another bubble set. I don't know. something in the bag that I should be looking at? Oh, there is. Two things. Let's talk about those a little briefly, too. Look, we've got an eraser and a pencil. Okay. That's going to be interesting. How can I make a message out of this? What would you do with this? You would what? 
not something, okay? Maybe an animal, okay? So these things would be good for that because we like to make pictures of creation and that's a wonderful thing to do as well, all right? Thank you for these. I'm gonna, put, I'm gonna give this back to you. Who wants to take the bag for next week in our sermon? Anybody? Can somebody come back with the bag? Will you take it? Okay. Let me grab my stuff out of here. And there you go. All right, thank you so much. We have some lessons now.
subject to them. Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to them. But we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while. Now crowned with glory and honor because of his suffered death, so that by the grace of God, he might take death for everyone. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it is fitting that God for whom and through whom everything exists, that we make the pioneer of their salvation through what he suffered. Both one who makes the people holy and those who are made holy are the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He said, I will declare your name to be my brothers and sisters. In the assembly, I will sing your praises. Go into the second. Sometimes we see them as two different things. Luther often talked about the law, and then he would talk about the gospel and grace, law and grace. And these two things appear to us sometimes to be contradictory, contradicting each other. It almost looks like that in the text today. On the one hand, Jesus lays down a very strict interpretation of the law. On the other hand, he's so welcoming to children and family and stuff. But I think when we look at things like the law and the gospel, the law and grace, we're really looking at things that are actually complementary, like two hands. In fact, Luther used that imagery. He said the law is like 
God's right hand of power. But the gospel is God's powerful left hand of grace. And hands, right, can oppose each other. But how ridiculous would that be if I let my right hand fight my left hand, really? They're supposed to be complementary. They're supposed to work together. And that's what we're seeing here in this text. And we want to approach this because we see it in our other passages as well. I would like to ask three questions. First, I'm going to ask a question about a strange little phrase, original intent. Have you ever heard that before? What does original intent mean? We're going to talk about that. Second question I want you to contemplate is what was God's original intent in creation? So we're going to define original intent, and we're going to talk about what God's original intent is in creation. Because we see Jesus doing this as he interprets the scripture. People come to him with a question, and we're looking at it. He's looking at it, using this. The last question we're going to ask is this. What is our sign that we're still tracking with Jesus? How do we know we're following along in his path as disciples, as believers? So those three questions. What's the original intent? What's God's original intent in creation? And how do we know we're still following him? when we look to follow Jesus as believers. So, you will recall that we, for the last two weeks, have been discussing two models of the Messiah. One is the one that the disciples prefer, the power Messiah was going to come and reorder creation, which is out of control. Israel on the top, hopefully one of them will be on the right and the left-hand side of Jesus, and, and we're going to just order everything and get rid of all the bad guys. That's the power Messiah. That's the one they want to go to right away. But Jesus has thrown up another model. The model of the servant Messiah, the suffering Messiah, the Messiah who must die first and rise from the dead. And they don't like that model. They're struggling hard against it. We've been looking at that for the past couple of weeks. But I want us to consider that again in this matrix that we've talked about. Law and grace. The right hand of God, the left hand of God. The truth is God is both-handed. And there's truth in both of those pictures. Jesus doesn't deny the idea of the power of Messiah. He says, some of you are going to see it coming. Some of you alive here, my disciples, will see the beginning of that. And someday I will come to judge the earth with, with great power and authority. But right now, you need to understand this other model first. In fact, if you can't understand it, then cut out that first picture. If that's getting in your way, you need to understand this model of grace and mercy. So let's go to our first question. What does the words do the words original intent mean? Original intent is actually a legal term. It was used in the circles, law circles, um, largely in circles of interpreting constitutional law. You see, when somebody writes a law down, and you can't go to them, let's say they passed away, and you want to ask, what do you mean by this law? You can't just knock on the door and say, what did you mean by that? You have to examine the original intent of their words. So when we look at, for instance, our Constitution, this is just an example, the American Constitution, there is in there a clause called the General Welfare Clause, which says that one of the enumerated powers of the federal government, one of the things they're supposed to be doing, that's the government in Washington, is providing for the common or general welfare. Now, many people look at that and they say, well, that's what we're doing. We got a welfare system. We got Medicare, Medicaid. We have you know, healthcare systems now that we put in order, that's what that means. But you'd be wrong. If you think that's the original intent of the authors, because they had none of that in mind when they wrote that phrase. Now we can argue on whether or not that is a logical outcome of what they wrote, and there is debate on that. Some people say that the larger federal government shouldn't be doing that. Some other people say we can argue about that. But the 
let's just go back. The authors of that Constitution had no conception of an idea of a general welfare system as we have today. What they meant by that is that there are some things that the people can't do for themselves, that even the state governments are not good at, that the federal government needs to do, such as raise an army to defend these United States. That needs to be done on a federal level, right? And there were other things that they were thinking of. They were not thinking of a welfare system. So when you get to this idea of original intent, it's the honest way to approach any statement of law in order to understand it as it's originally written. Now you can argue about what the implications are later. But you can't simply impose your idea on what that law is without noting the original intent. So why am I bringing this up? Because Jesus, in our gospel today, as you've noticed, goes to sources. <laughs> in fact, he goes to two. The Pharisees ask him a question about law. It's the law that's written in the Old Testament that governed Israel, or was supposed to. It was a question about divorce. Now what does Jesus say? He says, what does Moses say? Let's go to the source. Moses, kind of the apostle of the Old Testament who talked to God in conversation. What does Moses say? Well, he say, well, they don't really give a complete answer. You notice it's a little bit clipped. They say, well, Moses said, you know, give her a law of divorce and send her away. Or give her a bill of divorce and send her away. You need to know that in this day, that there was actually an argument over this. And it was an argument between two schools of Pharisaical thought. Now, normally we think of the Pharisees as just one group among the Jewish leaders. And we sometimes get a bad picture of them. Pharisees bad, they're opposing Jesus. Jesus good, disciples on the other side. And by and large, that's true. But there are actually two schools. And if you're sensitive to reading scripture, you're going to discover that some Pharisees are actually on Jesus' side. But one of the things the Pharisees thought that when the Messiah would come is he would explain controversies in the law. And there were two schools of thought. And one school of thought, what we might call the more liberal school, said, all you have to do is give your wife a certificate of divorce and let her go. She burns your toast, let her go. But the other more conservative school said, no. You cannot divorce your wife. This is sacred. You cannot do this. And maybe they would make an exception in case there was infidelity or something like that. But they were the other scripture. And notice what Jesus does. This is true of a lot of the controversies in scripture, by the way. It was a discussion among Jews in those days. And often we'll see Jesus come in with a completely different answer. Sometimes, and many times, he'll side with the liberal school. But this is a case where he sides with the conservative school. He says, you can't divorce your wife without committing adultery. Or making her commit adultery because you know you're going to get married again. This is a breaking of commandment, he says. It's a very strict interpretation of the commandments. And that's what he gives. And I want you to know, notice simply, Jesus does not brush aside Moses. He doesn't say, well, I'm Moses, you know. He was mistaken. No. He gives a very, very concise and constrict, or a conservative interpretation of the law. That's important to understand. In our day and age, our culture, and Stephen in the church, wants to sort of redefine what the law says. So be careful. We try to redefine things. Call them different lifestyles. Sometimes we use euphemisms. Be very careful. Because Jesus does not do that. He does not brush aside those rules. No, instead he goes to the original intent. And what does he say about Moses? He says, look, guys, the reason this law was allowed by God, given through Moses, is because of your hard hearts. What's he saying here when he says that? What's he saying? What he's saying is there are such things in life as the choice between two evils. You know, when I was
was young, I never thought that that was the case. I always thought, oh, there's good, there's bad, I'm always going to choose the good if I'm, you know, really tracking with God. Sometimes, and you will know this if you live life, some of you older folks, and I point at myself, there are situations where you have no good choices. Only two bad choices. It's called the choice of the lesser of two evils. And what Jesus is saying here with the law of Moses is, you guys have hard hearts. Sometimes there's not going to be a solution. The reason this law was given is because sometimes there are going to be good choices. But then Jesus does something else. He said, let's go even deeper. Let's go to the original intent of God in creation. What was God's original intent? Because that's where our hearts should be. He says, originally, God intended for the two to become one. Much like the Trinity, the three are one. In marriage, the two become one. That's the original intent. And it's not an accident that the ensuing action that takes place here with the little kids, the disciples, they're all into this order thing. And remember we said the law speaks of order. Okay. Grace speaks of harmony. We need them both. They're both necessary, like our right and left hands, or like riding a bicycle. You want to stay right in the center. It's a balancing act. Jesus is not sweep away the law. We're in error if we think we can do that. But there's always grace, he says. And the original intent was for us to live as one in unity and in harmony. When you go back to the original creation, you see that. Do you see that in Genesis? What is God doing? He's inviting Adam to participate in the creation by naming the animals. We're invited to participate in creation. Not only in ordering things, we're told in the original creation, God says, go out, be fruitful, multiply, subdue, and rule over the earth. And those are very strong power words, right hand words of power. Law and order. We're called to do that. You can think about some of the early folks that came to this area, the pioneers that rested order out of a chaotic environment. If you've worked with your hands, you know sometimes it feels that way. How about farmers this year planted their crops and it just seemed like nature was against them. They had floods. And we have to go at it that way. That's true of our reality. That's a baseline reality that we as human beings have to deal with. But on the other hand, that was not the final purpose because God planted a garden and set a pair in that garden to work it and keep it. This speaks of harmony. That's what we're originally intended for and that's a word of grace. What does it come down to? These two competing models, both are true. But one needs to happen first. You see, there's a lot of order that we impose in the world. And you can have order without harmony, can't you? You can go to a place like North Korea. It's a very ordered little country. But there's not a lot of harmony in there. Or you think of Iran or other places. There's order, but not a lot of harmony. Because the heart needs to be changed first. Did you notice what the writer of Hebrews said? And I hope you noticed that he quoted our psalm. We got to read that psalm twice, psalm 8. He quotes that portion. He says, I'm astounded, God, at this wonderful ordered cosmos. That's what cosmos means. Ordered creation. It's beautiful. It's ordered. And what's more is that you put all of these things under our feet. But the writer of Hebrews says, yeah, you know, that's true. But really, if you look at it, we don't yet see everything really under our feet, do we? 
Chaos threatens to break out at any time. It did the spring, the floods. It does in our warfare, places like Ukraine, Israel, and Palestine. It does in our relationships. It threatens to break out at any time. The writer of Hebrews is a realist. He says, yeah, it's true. We're amazing creatures. We seem to have the power over most of our created order. We're even, you know, if he were a modern man, he'd say, we've even gone to the moon. But, we really don't see everything quite under control and in harmony, do we? And here's his next turn of the phrase. He says, but we do see Jesus. Jesus is the model. Jesus is the example of the perfect balance between the law and the grace of God. Between the power of God and God as our servant who loves and cares for us. The perfect balance. And he is the one that we are to follow. So, to our last question. How do we know we're still tracking Jesus? Do you have a balanced view? If you're constantly trying to make excuses and say, well, God didn't really mean what he meant by the law. No. Can't do that. Or, if on the other side, you lose the idea of grace and mercy because you're so intent on keeping the law. No, that's not right either. There's a balance between those two in which we have to say the law is real, but God has saved us from the consequences and will remake us from the inside out so that someday when he comes again, there really will be order and harmony together. That's what we're working for here as believers. That's what Christ promises us. That's how we know we're on the track. Amen. Join us now in the hymn of number 472. <coughs>
go to a time of prayer. Mr. So Lord, we do come to you and we ask that you hear our prayers. You invite us to come to you to ask. You say, ask and you shall receive. And we know that it's true. There are many things that we have received graciously from your hand simply by asking. We thank you. We thank you for those. And so now, Lord, we, we lift up our cries and our petitions and our, our needs to you. We have people that we're concerned about, folks, that we want to pray for. And so we lift these names, Lord, to you. We lift up Paul and Donna and Kitty, June, Daryl, and Pam, Ben, Derek, Kevin, Betty, Beth, Kim, Wendy, Greg, Tracy, Dennis, Gannon, Keith, Don, Katina, Tori, Lisa, Carol, and we think of folks, Lord, that are in our care homes. Think of Paul and Diane, Ruth, Tom. Lord, in your mercy. Father, well, we, we lift these names to you, those that are in the armed forces or perhaps away at school. We name these Matt and Braden, Greg, John. Clay, Landon, Justin, Taylor, John, Laura, Micaiah, and our missionaries, Lord, representing you, the gospel, Aaron and Willie. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Father, we do lift up other concerns, too. Concerns in the world where there are conflicts and wars, Lord. We think of those in the Ukraine and Russia. Palestine, Israel, Lord. Complex. And we don't know how to solve them. We're not good at the harmony thing. It seems like the order that we impose is not very harmonious. And so, Lord, we ask for you to enter these situations. Be especially with your people, your church there in these places, that the church may have the solution through the gospel, pointing to you as the example, as the way of balance between order and harmony, between what must be true and between grace. Lord, in your mercy. We pray too, Lord, for others who need your help, some on our minds now. And so we lift these names up to you silently. Lord, in your mercy. Thank you, Lord, that you do hear us, that you care about us, and that you are quick to answer. Now give us the grace to accept the answers that you give us, Lord, for we ask all these things in your name. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. And all the Lord with you. And at this time, we will take our offering.
Come to the feast of God.
body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us, renew us, fill us with his spirit. Amen. Amen. And our last hymn is number 518. 